afternoon everyone and welcome to Scaffold's very first webinar for 2015. I am very excited because it is a full house in this webinar. We have had so much interest in today's webinar that some investors are actually waiting online as we speak as they could not get in spot. My name is Shepard Conera. Now we're in for a very exciting hour of insight from two very successful investors. Uh, what will happen today is we have Roger Montgomery uh, kicking us off. He will share his uh, portfolio expertise, we'll run a poll, and then we'll get our general manager at Scaffold to run through how Scaffold's picked the 2015 top five stocks for Money Magazine. And we will have a very good long time for Q&A. So as I said before, please feel free to fire those questions through and uh, try and get into Roger's head, try and get into Chris's head. How do they invest and how do they pick up those good value stocks? Without further ado, um, we'll get straight into the questions. A fund manager and also founder of Scaffold, really to a lot of you, Roger does not need that much of an introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Roger Montgomery. Thanks, Shepard. Uh, appreciate that. Um, it's a very, very challenging subject, building portfolios and building successful portfolios. So it is going to require some concentration uh, from everyone. Uh, so. Um, pay attention to what I'm talking about because there's a there's a lot to cover in this particular subject and we've only got a limited amount of time in which we can actually talk about this subject. So, so I think to put in context what I'm going to talk about, I'm actually going to be very transparent with you. Perhaps the most frustrating complaint I've ever received is when someone calls me or sends me an email to say that they own shares in a company and it's gone down and it's been devastating for them. That should never happen. Now it's not the case that we are immune as investors to buying businesses that uh, surprise us on the downside. They may, for example, have lied, management might have lied about their prospects. Uh, it could be that uh, something completely unanticipated has happened to the performance of the business and as a result, uh, its share price collapses. But if you've constructed your portfolio properly, there's absolutely no reason why it should, uh, that particular incident should have caused anything other than a minor, uh, very small speed hump on the road to successful investing. So today I'm going to talk about the, the way I think about uh, building portfolios. Building stock market portfolios is only one part of the broader portfolio. So in a few moments time I'm going to be talking about asset allocation and how much you allocate to shares and cash and overseas shares and property and so forth. Remembering that the share portfolio is part of a broader portfolio. So in terms of what we think about when considering a portfolio, the first consideration is that we're investing in businesses rather than stocks. The problem that I guess emerges when you take this approach is that the value or the market value of your portfolio is printed based on the market value of the stock, not the intrinsic value of the business. So a great feature in Scaffold which is available is, is a feature that allows you to compare the intrinsic value of the portfolio that you've constructed to the market price. And over time, if you buy the sorts of businesses I'm going to talk about in a moment, there's no reason why the intrinsic value of the entire stock portfolio shouldn't be rising. So what are the sorts of businesses when combined help to build portfolios that increase their intrinsic value, ignoring the market price for a moment. Well, it's most important that they're high quality businesses. By that we mean A1 to B3 businesses. So I'm interested in businesses that are either A1, A2 or A3 or B1, B2 or B3 businesses. Now, the first point to make is an A1 business is not a business that is immune to the business cycle. It's not a business that's immune to making losses occasionally. It's not immune to competition. It's a high quality business based on its historical performance and its balance sheet. But an A1 business has the lowest probability of something poor befalling it 
but it doesn't mean it has no probability of that occurring, which is precisely why we still need to have a portfolio rather than just one or two A1 businesses. So the first step is high quality. The second step is bright, the second part of the equation is bright prospects. This can be an A1 business, meaning that historically it's generated fantastic performance and it's got a solid balance sheet, but it could have deteriorating prospects. Businesses in the mining services space are some of the businesses that meet this particular set of criteria. There could be an A1 business like Monodelphus, for example, or Wally Parsons, very high quality business, historically done very, very well, but their prospects might be deteriorating. After businesses that are both high quality, as measured by Scaffold, and also have bright prospects in our view. And the final part of the equation, the final part of the equation is a bargain price. And this is where we're trying to mitigate the risk as much as possible of making a mistake in the first two parts of the equation. So if we're wrong about the quality or if we're wrong about the prospects, then if we've bought the company at a cheap enough price, it should help us mitigate the extent of the losses that we might suffer if we get the first two parts wrong. And that's also mitigated by the fact that we have a, a broad portfolio, a portfolio of a number of opportunities, not just one. So if we're looking for A1 to B3 businesses, you can see on this particular slide we've used Scaffold to select those businesses. And what we find firstly is that A1, A1 uh, to the B3 businesses tend to have lower debt uh, to total capital or debt to equity than the broader market. And you can see the A1 to B3 businesses average 2.1% debt to equity versus 19.1% for the rest of the market. Despite the fact that they've got less gearing, they believe it or not, have higher return on equity, so they generate an aggregate return on equity of 16.5% versus about 4% for the rest of the market. And they also have a, a, a higher cash flow yield, so they tend to be businesses that generate lots of cash. Now companies that meet this criteria, there's only 426 companies that meet this criteria. So your portfolio, or the portfolio that I've created for, for myself, uh, and for our business um, is from that universe only, not the other 1300 odd companies in the rest of the ASX. So there's about, only about a quarter of the listed companies that meet the criteria. Now you might be disappointed by that, that excites me, it tells me that my work uh, is minimised uh, and I can focus my staff's time uh, on the businesses that meet the criteria rather than the rest of them that are wasting our time. Now that's not, of course, that's not to say that the other 1,300 companies won't, their share prices won't rise spectacularly, and in fact many will, uh, but we're just not playing the speculation game. We're in the business of investing in good quality businesses for our portfolio because we want to buy a portfolio that over time its intrinsic value is going to rise. It's going to be worth more in the future than it is today. Now when we talk about prospects, one of the other things that we're interested in is a competitive advantage. There's a number of ways to identify competitive advantages. The simplest way, using Scaffold, is of course to look at a sustained return on equity that's very, very high, and also a low level of debt, or debt that's being paid down quickly. Companies can't generate high rates of return on equity forever, usually because competitors come into the market and compete against that company and take some of its market share or take some of its margin. And that means that a company's return on equity tends to go down in the face of competition. But where you find a business that over long periods of time has sustained a high rate of return on equity, maybe it's got something that competitors can't compete away. Another way of thinking about return on equity is to break the return on equity down to these uh, components here. So we've got earnings divided by sales, which leads of course is your profit margin, sales divided by assets, which is asset turnover, and assets divided by equity, which is your leverage. Now, if the company's high return on equity comes from a very high margin, or the first component of that return on equity, then you should focus your analysis on identifying a competitive advantage on the consumer advantage. 
In other words, does this particular company have a product that is uh, reputa more reputable? Is it a product that has, for example, um, a, a better offer or, or it lasts longer or it's got a, a better reputation? Um, they're the sorts of things that you should be thinking about. If the return on equity stems from a high turnover, the second part of the return on equity calculation, wow. then you want to ask yourself whether the company has a production advantage. And the production advantage uh, comes from, for example, um, uh, I'll give you an example. A company has developed a, a manufacturing plant 20 or 30 years ago at a cheaper price than would be available if the company was going to build that plant today or if a competitor was going to build that plant today. If companies are high in both, both the margin and asset turnover, um, then you might want to consider whether the company has what's called the network effect. So for those of you who don't know what a network effect is, uh, think of uh, REA Group or realestate.com.au. Realestate.com.au has the network effect. More people look for properties for sale on realestate.com.au because there are more properties for sale. And there are more properties for sale because more people are looking there. So the agents load up more properties because more people are looking and more people are looking because there are more properties. So this is a virtuous circle and it's very, very hard to remove the network effect uh, once it's been entrenched for some time. It's going to be very difficult for a competitor to displace REA Group in Australia. Finally, if a company's high return on equity stems solely from high asset leverage, that's the last part of the equation, then you need to be sceptical of any competitive advantage at all and we would say that the company's prospects aren't very bright at all. All right, Roger, when you started talking, you mentioned the word discipline and I suppose the next question on the screen is, what rules do you always stick to when building the portfolios? That's what I'm going to focus on now. So um, uh, we think uh, that the rules you need to stick to um, relate to allocation, um, so that's the most important part. We need to stick to asset allocation um, and, and questions around asset allocation involve not only um, how much to put in shares or cash or overseas property uh, or overseas shares or in local property based on your expectations for returns in those asset classes, but also what stage of life you're at, Shepard. So um, let's suppose, uh, I'll tell you a story. Many, many years ago when I was at university, uh, I borrowed $10,000 from the Commonwealth Bank to trade futures. It turned out to be a disastrous foray into investing. I made a little bit of money to begin with. We got some really good returns and then we gave it all back and we lost the $10,000 uh, that I put in uh, I initially. Was I concerned about that? No. Why? Because I knew that over the course of my career I would make that $10,000 back pretty quickly. But if you're in your uh, late 70s, for example, then you have choices with your money uh, to either spend it on necessities or to enjoy it on lifestyle. You haven't got the capacity to make it back quickly, so you want to be less risky. So you might allocate less money to equities than you would to, for example, fixed interest or bonds uh, or another asset class. Many, many uh, attendees today might not know that equities in general are three times more volatile than bonds. And so if you were at a later stage of life, you might consider putting three times as much of your portfolio into bonds uh, as you would equities, bearing in mind, of course, that the bond market has rallied enormously as interest rates have been cut. And in the future, if interest rates go up, then you might find that bonds start to fall and you lose capital on that. So you're thinking about the, the future prospects for different assets as well as, uh, as well as what stage of life you're in. Now, Ray Dalio is a very, very famous hedge fund manager, he runs the hard, largest hedge fund in the world uh, and uh, he believes uh, that there's an all-weather portfolio that everyone can create and it tends to produce a return of about 10% per annum and it has done for a good 20 or 30 years now um, and it's done that with very little risk and I'll tell you what he does or what he suggested. He believes there are four environments to invest in. There's deflation and inflation, 
strong growth and weak economic growth. They're your four environments. You want an all-weather portfolio. An all-weather portfolio is going to do reasonably well in all of those environments. And here's what he suggested. You can Google Ray Dalio's all-weather portfolio if you want to. Um, and here's his suggestion. It might be right for you, it might not be. And again, keep in mind what I said about the prospects for the different asset classes. But he suggested 30% in stocks, because they're three times riskier than bonds, 55% in bonds with 15% at shorter duration bonds, so seven to 10 years, 40% in 20 to 25 years, and that counters the volatility of the stocks. And here's something that's really, really, you wouldn't hear from Montgomery, uh, but Ray Dalio, remember, is a hedge fund manager, so he invests in all of these things. 7.5% in gold and 7.5% in commodities. Now, why the commodities and the gold? That's to cover the inflationary environment, because in high inflationary environments, what you're going to find is that the the uh, stocks and bonds aren't going to go very well. So you want to have the exposure to gold and commodities to offset that. And when you go back 30 years and rebalance annually, um, it's generated about, and this is from 1984 to 2013, it's generated about a 10% per annum return net of all fees. Here's the interesting, interesting part. That portfolio has been profitable in 86% of all years. So it's had four negative years out of those 30 odd years, and the average loss has only been 1.9% per annum. Now I think you could do even better, you could do even better if you were able to anticipate, of course, which asset class was going to do better than the others. That's almost impossible, so we're not going to try and do that. So what do we have left to potentially do better? Because remember, the 30% that was invested in stocks for this particular test was invested in the index. Now I think over the long run we can beat the index using scaffold by investing in high quality businesses, the sort of businesses that we talked about earlier. Another part of portfolio management that is important is rebalancing. Now we do this monthly. We are rebalancing the portfolio on a monthly basis, but you might choose to do it quarterly, you might choose to do it annually. Ray Dalio's portfolio was tested by rebalancing annually back to the original weights. So what does rebalancing mean? Well, let's suppose we put 30% um, into three, 10% uh, into three stocks. So we've got 30%. That's our equity valuation, our equity weighting of the total portfolio. So we've got 10% in three stocks. One of them doubles. All else being equal, we now have 20% in one stock and 10% in the other two. The idea is to sell that single stock that's rallied by, uh, that's doubled, rallied by 100% and to bring it back down so and redistribute the uh, returns from that into the other asset classes so we're back to our original weights. And we're doing that um, uh, on a monthly basis and that is something that a lot of people aren't disciplined about. So that's a really, really important part um, of managing the risk of catastrophe. What we've just seen in the market this week, we've seen a lot of high quality businesses that have their share prices have done phenomenally well over the last few months, but they haven't met consensus analyst expectations and their share prices have fallen six, seven, eight, nine percent in a day. So if you want to avoid those that kind of volatility or you want to, you can't avoid it of course, but if you want to mitigate the, the risk of that volatility affecting your portfolio, you have to be rebalancing on a regular basis. So the whole purpose of asset allocation, thinking about the environment that's going to generate the returns from those different asset classes and the rebalancing, the whole purpose is to minimise the risk of catastrophe. You're never going to avoid the risk of a single issue, a single stock, missing consensus forecasts or announcing a downgrade or suffering from the business cycle or economic circumstances. It's impossible to avoid that in a portfolio. But if we've got 10 players in our portfolio, if we have 10 players playing for our team and one of them is red carded and is put on the bench because they've downgraded their results, we've got nine other players that are still doing well for us. So that's why we diversify and have a broader portfolio. 
Now, what is the, we're trying to maximize also, as well as minimizing the risk of catastrophe, we're trying to maximize the chance of a good return. My definition of a good return is one that over the long run for the whole portfolio beats inflation. In other words, it maintains your purchasing power. So in 10 years time, you can go to the same restaurants that you can go to today. But not only that, you, can, you might even be able to go to a better restaurant or travel business class instead of economy because you've not only maintained your purchasing power, but you've beaten inflation. You've done better and therefore improved your purchasing position. Now, in terms of a process to actually build this portfolio, how do we how do we think about that? Uh, how do we do that? Well, here's one example on this particular slide. So I'll go through this reasonably quickly um, uh, because your particular process will be different. But what we do is we use scaffold to determine the A1 to B3 ratings. That gives us a universe of about 300 stocks. And you saw earlier there were 426 today, but roughly 300 to 400 companies in our universe. We then rank those companies based on what we think their earnings growth is going to be. Uh, we rank them based on their valuation. Uh, so we then bring value into the process and we rank them quantitatively. We knock out the bottom 150, we keep the top 150, we then allocate the new companies on that list that we haven't researched before, we rank them to an analyst, and an analyst then goes out and does what's called qualitative research. The qualitative research is the research that I was talking about earlier, looking at the prospects of the business, looking at its competitive position, looking at its competitive advantage, and deciding whether or not that competitive advantage is sustainable. Um, we may even talk to, and we're in a, an enviable position, I guess, because we, if we talk to a company's CEO or their uh, investor relations department, then what we actually uh, often receive is a, an invitation to speak to management. And because of that, we can talk to them. Uh, we talk to competitors and customers as well. Uh, we narrow that universe of 150 companies down to about 100 companies. Uh, it then goes, it then go, or there are about 100 companies that probably meet uh, our criteria and still survive that qualitative test. The remaining companies that are still good value then go to an investment committee uh, for uh, for proposal to be put into a portfolio. Then we go through our portfolio construction process. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about the portfolio construction process. Thanks, Roger. But before we go there, how often should an investor review or adjust their portfolio? Okay. okay. The answer to that question lies in the size of the portfolio. Let's suppose you've got $80,000 allocated to shares and you're going to put 10% into uh, into each company. Okay, so you've got $8,000 in, in 10 companies. That means that if the stock doubles or it goes up 20% or 30% or 40% and you have to rebalance, you're still going to, you're going to be selling maybe $1,000 worth of shares or, or $1,500 worth of shares depending on how much that share price has gone up, all other things being equal. If you have left less than $80,000 in your portfolio, it makes it very expensive to transact and balance your portfolio frequently. So I think if you have about $80,000 in your portfolio, you could rebalance monthly if you wanted to do that, and it still wouldn't be very expensive to do using an online broker. But if you've got less than $80,000, you don't have the opportunity to rebalance or fine tune the portfolio very frequently um, because it's going to be too expensive in terms of brokerage. And so you might go quarterly uh, or even um, even every second quarter or every six months or uh, you might do it every, um, every, every year. So depending on the size of the portfolio, that's going to have some de determination on how frequently you rebalance that portfolio. Uh, that $80,000 rule I've, I've really just made up, um, but it seems logical to me based on sort of a $15 transaction uh, using one of the online brokers. So the, the, next, uh, the next point is this portfolio construction. How do we actually build portfolios? Well, here's some thoughts on how we do it over at Montgomery. Um, you can borrow some of this if you like, uh, or you can use your own, um, your own ideas. 
we basically start out from an equal weighting baseline. So we like all the companies equally to be in our portfolio. So we're going to put an equal amount in each portfolio. But unfortunately, not every company deserves an equal weighting. And so what we do is we constrain uh, each position based on the liquidity rules that we've got. So because we're so large, we're managing uh, now almost uh, uh, $650 million. Um, because we're large, we have to invest in businesses that we could get out of quickly if we make a mistake, for example. Um, and so we're reducing the position size based on liquidity. Uh, and so we also then constrain based on quality. So an A1 business, the maximum initial position we can put on is 7%. For a B3 business, 4%. Uh, and so everything in between that is between 7 and 4%. Now they are the maximum sizes. That's not the minimum, that's the maximum. So we might put in significantly less than that to begin with, assuming that we believe that the price of the stock might fall and we'll buy some more next week or next month at a lower price and build up to that initial position. Uh, and you can see here A1 resource companies, we might even have 3.5%. We tend not to like resource companies, we've tended not to invest in them, so we haven't, uh, we haven't invested that 3.5%. Now, more favourable scaffold scores are weighted up to 2.5 times, 2, uh, 1.25 times the other investments. So if we have 2% in a B3, we might decide, well, we don't want to have 7% in an A1 because we'd be skewed too much to that A1 business in the portfolio. So we make sure that the relative positions aren't too far away from each other as well. And then the final, uh, the final point there is they're called GICs uh, sectors. In other words, um, the Thomson Reuters of the world and the Morning Stars of the world, they, they put companies in particular sectors, resources, industrials, consumer, staples and so on. Um, we make sure that we don't have more than 20% in a particular sector either uh, in an initial position. Now the question that was asked of me last week I thought was a very good one. What happens if the share price goes up? What happens if you go above 7%? Well we have limits as well. So we're happy to, we're happy to put a 7% maximum size as the initial position, but of course all things being equal, if one of our 7% positions doubles, it's now going to be 14%. We allow ourselves a maximum weighting of 20% in any one stock after we've purchased it. We've never done that, we tended to rebalance before we've got to that point, uh, but that's the maximum that we'll allow for ourselves. So that way we can't be in a situation where one stock is 30 or 40% of our portfolio and then it comes out with disappointing news and it halves and we've lost 20% in a day. Um, that can't happen because we're, we're constraining the maximum size the position can be. If we've also, and a couple of final rules here, if we've also um, uh, find that we've got a couple of businesses that might not be in the same sector, but they tend to be exposed to the same economic influences, uh, then we might actually remove some of them. So for example, a, a flexi group business and a bank aren't the same, they're not in the same sector, they don't do the same thing, but interest rates are going to impact them the same way. So in a rising interest rate environment, we might not want to have too much invested across both of those types of businesses. So we'll de-weight similar businesses. And again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, we, we actually look at trading volumes and liquidity, uh, and then we actually restrain those as well. So we'll say, well, we think that we assume that there'll be less liquidity in the future rather than more liquidity in the future, and that reduces um, uh, how much we'll allocate to a particular stock. Uh, and finally, um, we'll take advantage of particular circumstances. So quite frankly, if a, if a company goes well above our estimate or Scaffold's estimate of intrinsic value, uh, the share price double the intrinsic value, we're going to take advantage of that particular circumstance and reweight that particular position. All right, thanks Roger. You mentioned uh, spreading risk, but before I ask you the next question, I might actually just ask that question to all our attendees. And the question that I'll ask Roger next, which I want you guys to answer first, is 
how many stocks should be in an individual's portfolio in order to spread the, the risk Roger was talking about. This, Roger, this is what most of our attendees today are thinking. So 50% of the 500 people that are in this webinar today think there should be 5 to 15 stocks in, a put, in an individual's portfolio. About 40% think there should be 15 to 20 stocks in an individual's portfolio. And about 9% think there should be 20 plus. Roger, how many stocks do you think should be in an individual's portfolio? Well, I know what the 1% who are saying 1 to 5. Um, I know what they think. Uh, unfortunately, um, you don't want to bet the farm on one or two uh, stocks. Uh, and even Charlie Munger, uh, who works with Warren Buffett or did work with Warren Buffett over at Berkshire Hathaway for many decades, um, despite their concentration and their belief that you really should uh, know the company well, uh, know its prospects intimately, even they said never bet the farm uh, on any one particular uh, uh, stock. Uh, or two or three for that matter. So, uh, so the one percent, one to five stocks uh, is not correct. Five for fifteen is starting to sound right at the upper end of that. Fifteen is starting to sound right. And when we look at this next chart here, um, what we've got on the vertical axis or on the y-axis is standard deviation. So, the volatility of a portfolio. Now, I don't think that's a very good measure of real risk. Real risk is the possibility of loss, um, but volatility makes it easier or harder to stick with a portfolio. The more volatile the portfolio is, the more it swings around, the harder it is to stick with it for the long run. And what we know is that as we add stocks across the horizontal axis from left to right, you can see that the standard deviation of the portfolio starts to fall, and it falls very very rapidly initially as you go from one stock to two stocks from left to right, you can see there's a big drop in standard deviation or volatility of portfolios. But as you add the 40th stock, there's a lot less benefit from adding the 40th stock. So the number is between 1 and 40, for example. And I think it's somewhere, you can see it's where the curve starts to flatten out. So it's somewhere between 15 and 20 stocks. Now what we've learnt recently from, this, this research was done in the 1970s and it's been the staple of investment advice ever since. But what we've learnt is in the last couple of decades, the last 20 years, we've noticed that stocks generally are more volatile than they were before. So the entire curve shifts up. So if you want to reduce volatility back to what it was in the 1970s with 15 to 20 stocks, you probably have to have 20 to 30 stocks to get the same low volatility that was experienced when this research was done and was suggested that 15 to 20 stocks was the right number of stocks to hold in a portfolio. So it's probably 20 to 30 now because the entire curve has shifted vertically upwards because stocks these days are more volatile. Now why are they more volatile? Because you've got a generational avalanche occurring. Baby boomers around the world are all about to hit 65 and they've started to do it en masse and as a result they're thinking about retirement. They're what I call being what they're what it, they're in what I describe as being the panic accumulation phase of their life, and that is they've got five years to go before retirement, and they're thinking I haven't got enough to enough to retire on, and they're moving stocks around much more. They're much more frightened of stocks that are going down. They're more fearful of missing out, and that's driving greater volatility in stock prices. So the curve shifted up, 20 to 30 stocks probably is the right number of stocks to have in a portfolio and if you can find 20 to 30 wonderful businesses and remember the great thing about Scaffold is Scaffold is reducing the time it takes to identify those outstanding businesses and that's the power of Scaffold for me. It's We use it at Montgomery to reduce the universe from 1700 odd companies down to three or four hundred that we can start doing the qualitative work on and it would take, it would be a lot more expensive for us and, and a lot more time uh, if we didn't have the ability to narrow the universe down to the A1 to B3 companies and those that are currently looking like good value.